<laughs> Morning guys, uh, hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, I'll be honest with you all, I, I hate public speaking. Uh, but when I was asked to introduce Dr. Sandra Richter, there's like no way I could say no. Um, in her short time here at Westmont, she's already impacted the lives of many other students just like me. Her and her family have been through so much to be here. With the recent fires, mudslides, and daily struggles of adapting to a whole new lifestyle, I can't express how blessed we are as a community to, to have her and her husband, Dr. Steven Socalas, and her two daughters, Noelle and Elise, here in Santa Barbara. And for that, we at Westmont want to thank you and your family from the bottom of our hearts. Graduating with a PhD from Harvard, a master's from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and a bachelor's from Valley Forge Christian College, Dr. Richter serves both as a seminary and undergrad professor. For 15 years, she's led an Israel studies program with her seminarians and moves back and forth from the academy and the church in her work. Internationally known for her work on the Deuteronomistic history, Hebrew, and environmental theology, uh, where was I? Dr. Richter is the living proof of a woman's rightful place in ministry. Not only is Sandra Richter an incredible scholar, she is also one of the most loving and caring individuals I've ever gotten to know. When I was at my lowest point last year, suffering from uh, infection in my brain, professors like Sandra Richter <laughs> show me the true love and grace that was mountain embodies for their students. Sandra Richter, like many other professors here, have convinced me that I've made the right decision coming here. She's changed my life forever. And let her change yours. And with that, it is with great honor that I introduce to you the Robert H. Gundy Professor of Biblical Studies, Professor Sandra Richter. Well, usually you wind up crying at the end of a sermon, not at the beginning. <laughs> um, Kevin, thank you so much. What an honor. I can't imagine, I can't ask for a stronger introduction or recommendation. So, so hey folks, it's really good to be here this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, good morning, Westmont. Happy Monday, Westmont. Mondays are a little hard. I don't know about you. <clears throat> um, a little sick. Uh, I'm sure most, uh, not most, but a number of you are as well, probably because I caught whatever I had from you. <laughs> but that's okay, it's worth the price. So what an honor to be standing in front of you. Thanks to our chapel staff and our new campus pastor for the invitation. Um, again, I hope Monday is treating you well. The passage that I've chosen for this morning comes out of 1 Corinthians, Chapter 1, verses 25 through 31. Um, this is one of Paul's letters to the believers in Corinth. And what he is up to in this letter is he is reminding the Corinthians of who they are. One of the illustrations I use in the Epic of Eden is that um, too often we as Christians, in forgetting who we've been, we lose who we are. And Paul is busy reminding them who they are and where they came from in order to encourage them in their faith. And so this is what Paul has to say. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when God called you. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Not many of you were valedictorians, not many varsity athletes, not many rich, not many teen star finalists. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that one can, no one can boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. He is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. 
Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, the reason that I chose this passage is because I was asked if I would be willing to tell you folks some part of my own story of faith this morning. Now, there are countless stories, hundreds, even thousands, that are actually represented in this room right now. The greatest one, of course, is the great story, that one about a heavenly father who will not rest until he seeks out every lost son of Adam and every wandering daughter of Eve. That great story about a God who simply will not let it go until he has stood in the crowd, as I reminded my intro to Old Testament class just last week, watching our lives being bartered away by trivial issues and trivial things and lies and says, no, no, that one, that one's mine. This is the story I get to usually tell, and it is the one I love to tell about our God, who not only casts the cosmos into place, but is the creator of our hearts, and whose deepest desire is that where he is, there we may be also. That's the story I usually tell. My own story is just one little addendum to that great story, because I, of course, was one of those wandering, lost daughters of Eve, wandering in the darkness, having absolutely no idea what I was worth. And yet, as Paul says, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So I, who am now your Gundry chair, and who have traveled hither and yon in my education and teaching and paradigm design and ministry and speaking and publications and all that stuff that Kevin spoke of, I want to take this morning to do two things. One, I want to give witness. I want to give witness of the God who called my life back from the darkness and made something where there was nothing. And then two, I want to speak to every one of you who is within earshot of me this morning and tell you that this God who did it for me will surely do it for you as well. He is the God who has indeed chosen the weak things of this world, the broken things, the pieces that nobody thought could be put back together to shame the strong. So my story, and we'll leap in because chapel is short. I come from one of those upbringings that most people would prefer not to claim. Now like many stories, it didn't start off that way. I was born in Norfolk, Virginia, which is a Navy base on the East Coast. That's on the other side of the Rockies. You've heard of it. That is where all Navy children are supposed to be born. It's kind of written into the press. My dad was an officer, he was really smart and really talented, he looked a little bit too much like Tom Cruise, and I'm not exaggerating, he was a fighter pilot actually, you know, one of the cool people. My mother was the first member of her extended family to go to college and earned a degree as a registered nurse with great pride. They were young, they were beautiful, they were very smart, and looking at my parents' wedding pictures, you would say, oh, those are the beautiful people. In fact, if your parents have ever forced you to watch Dick Van Dyke, you know, remember that show, Black and White? Oh, Rob, come on, a few of you. <laughs> that show that demonstrated what life was supposed to look like in the 1960s, those were my parents. In fact, every time I watch it, I get a little bit nostalgic. He was the quarterback of his high school football team. She was a cheerleader. He looked awesome in his dress whites, and she managed to hold down a full-time job, have five babies, and keep her figure. They had unlocked that elusive door into the popular club, club, which was evident by the many parties that they attended. And according to the wisdom of this world, they had everything going for them. This is the home into which I was born. Well, my parents didn't actually have quite everything going for them. You see, in addition to being beautiful and talented, my mother was also the third generation offspring of an alcoholic family. And as a small town French Canadian Catholic girl from West Warwick, Rhode Island, a town that still bears her family name on one of its side streets, the life of a Navy wife quickly triggered in her the legacy of death that she had inherited. The long separations, the stress, the constant relocation, the perfectionism, the parties. And by the time I was five, my mom was losing her battle against her heritage. 
By the time I was 12, she was by all measures bouncing off of rock bottom. Life-threatening car accidents, arrests, eventually she was blackballed from her profession. And her five kids, we were in serious trouble. Now, if you know anything about alcoholics, you know that they are not to be controlled. And if you know anything about military men, you know that they like being in control. So in addition to all of the neglect and humiliation that comes from being the child of an alcoholic, and I know I'm not the only one in this room with this story, I also wound up living with all of the violence and abuse that comes from a very angry, depressed man who is losing his grip on his world. So the isolation of military life, the neglect of alcoholism, the violence of abusive parents, that was my childhood. And I'm going to guess, again, that I'm not the only one in this room with this story. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong impression about my family. We looked great. We were upper middle class. We had a nice house. We went to good schools. My, my sisters actually were doing fairly well in school. I, too, was a varsity athlete. We looked good on the outside. We were faithful Catholics. I was baptized at six weeks old, right on schedule, first communion at six, confirmed at 12, Catholic schools, CCD, the works. And I'd been raised right. I knew what good table manners were, although I often didn't use them, and I knew how to work. But I saw things that children are not supposed to see. And I heard things that children are not supposed to hear. And worse, I came to believe things about life and about me that God does not believe. And by the time I was in my early teens, I and my four sisters were well on our way to becoming statistics. My oldest sister found shelter in the gay subculture of her high school. My second sister was in constant physical conflict with my parents and involved with the bad boys and all the baggage they brought. My younger sisters, God help them, had I did bring Kleenex, <laughs> had no guidance and no parenting and no protection in a very broken world. By my birth order, for those of you who are studying psychology, I was the lost child, and I was indeed lost. By the time I was 13, I was a full-blown bulimic. I was desperately alone, self-hating, and regularly contemplating suicide. But in the midst of this very lonely, and very desperate scenario. I wandered across the street and stumbled into an Episcopalian youth group that was experiencing the sweeping move of the Holy Spirit during the Jesus movement in the Washington suburbs of the 1980s by now. And I met some Christians, some real Christians. Now you would think that I had already met some Christians, right? I'd been in church every Sunday of my life. But reality was that there was no one in my circle, in my experience, who actually believed any of this stuff. We were God-fearers, but that was all. And these Christians I met, well, they were only teenagers themselves. They were not theologically sophisticated, they were not particularly wise or wealthy, but they had experienced the love of God, and they were bold enough to share it, and they did. They came alongside this teenager who was so determined to never be hurt again that I was careful to reject everyone else before they had the chance to reject me. I was mouthy, I was arrogant, I was obnoxious, I was unresponsive, I could swear like a sailor, you cannot impress me. <laughs> I wasn't even clean, because I didn't have a mom. I had absolutely nothing to offer these people. Heck, I didn't even recognize my own need. But in reality, I was desperate for someone to look past my grisly exterior and see my wounded heart. And these teenagers, teenagers, actually did just that. And they did it in the most simple fashion possible. They became my friends. They welcomed me into their group. They invited me to their stuff. They hung out with me. They loved me. And in their eyes and in their actions, I began to see the possibility of something different. In their kindness, I caught a glimpse of the kindness of God. In their welcome, I began just barely to believe that God might be willing to welcome me. And in their fellowship, I began to understand what being a Christian might mean. So I was drawn to them, and thereby I was drawn to their God. 
Now, as is obvious by my self-description, I was no prize. <laughs> no one would have described me as influential, important, definitely not cool. Tough, but not cool. You would have had to have very good vision indeed to see any sort of special potential in my life. I was an underachieving student with poor social skills and worse personal hygiene. Yes, that was me. And these kids who witnessed to me, none of whom were wise by human standards either, nor were they influential or of noble birth. I was someone who no one would have predicted had the ability in my life to make a difference. No one. I was also someone who wasn't easy to be with. But in their friendship toward me, my stubborn, wounded heart started to open. So how did I finally come to a point of commitment? Well, remember how I told you that these people kept inviting me to their stuff? and I couldn't figure out why. Well, one of the stuff they invited me to, me too, was one of the early Jesus festivals, where some farmer out in Mercer, Pennsylvania, cut down all his corn and offered his fields to us to have this big Woodstock kind of festival, except for Jesus was at the middle of it. And so we all headed out, and they set up a big arena and huge sound speakers, and, and we set up tents, and all these folks convinced my parents that there would be tons of adult supervision. Yeah, right, none, zero zip. I can still remember walking through the cornfields in my flip-flop feet and cutting my feet on the old um, corn husks that were still sticking out of the ground. So the stage, um, the meeting tents, and we had at it. So I went with all of my new friends. My friends who I thought, thought I was already a Christian. Because you see, I'd already been hanging out with them for about two years, and I had figured out that to be an insider, you actually had to be a believer. So I kind of had it on the down low that I wasn't actually one yet. Ha! They, I thought they actually thought that. When in reality, of course, they were inviting me to this Jesus festival because they knew I wasn't a believer yet. So we headed off to Mercer, Pennsylvania, lots of tents. We had an absolute blast, completely illegal fires, roasting hot dogs in the middle of the field, bathing in the river, singing until three in the morning. We had so much fun. We also got incredibly bad sunburns because no one in the group was responsible enough to bring like a hat or sunblock or any of that stuff. Okay, so off we are. Jesus Festival, Mercer, Pennsylvania, and I loved what I saw, loved what I saw. And as I experienced my friends passionately worshiping their God, focused on the word, loving each other with a type of self-sacrificing humility I had never seen in my high school, I quickly realized that these people had something I did not and I wanted it. I wanted it bad. But I was too proud, too walled off, and too scared to ask. So I was super conflicted. Now an important part, detail, of this festival that you need to know is that at the end of the weekend they had planned a baptism in one of the cow ponds in the middle of the farm. And I knew that this was coming, but my entire experience with baptisms involved very small babies, lots of satin, and this birdbath thing that they called a font. And I honestly had never paid much attention. So, um, on Saturday afternoon, as I began to feel this sense of desperation, after the worship time at the Central Arena, I went off to pray. Now, I'd not done a lot of praying in my life, so I was anything but an expert. But when I managed to find a private place, kind of tucked between some leftover trees and some shrubbery, I began my first fledgling pursuit of the heavenlies. And I told God exactly what I just told you. Whatever it is those people have, I think I really need it, and I know I really want it. And there, in gym shorts, in a t-shirt, on the side of a cornfield, the one who cast the cosmos into place answered me. No, he actually answered me, like I heard his voice. And he said to me, if you want what they have, that baptism at the end of the weekend, I want you to go, I want you to step forward, and I want you to ask to be baptized. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, thousands of people watching me? My friends, who I thought thought I was already a Christian, watching me? 
all these folks paying attention to me, me, the kid who never wanted anyone to notice them, me with the wall that was so high and thick and no one was ever going to get past it. So what did this crusty adolescent say in response to the voice of the Almighty? No. No way. And I got up and walked away. This is crazy. There was no way I was going to go forward in front of all those people. No way I was going to announce to my new friends that I wasn't actually an insider. No way I was going to make a public spectacle of myself. No way. And so I got up from that place of prayer and I walked away. Can you believe that? God actually spoke to me and I walked away. But I was ill at ease because the Holy Spirit is an actual person. I was really nervous. My evolving plan was to forget this had ever happened, return home in the car caravan the next day with all of my defenses, sin and brokenness safely in place and pretend I'd never actually heard God talk to me. My plan was not to make an idiot out of myself by going forward in that baptism, but I couldn't quite make peace with that plan. In fact, I could hardly sleep that night in my little tent and sleeping bag. The next morning I did the usual, I joined the crew in the arena, I sang the songs, and when everyone else dissipated, sitting on one of those blankets, I turned to a girl next to me. She was older than me, the austere age of 17. And I said to her, um, um, casually and theoretically speaking, uh, do you think my baptism at birth was enough to get me to heaven? Now, have I mentioned to you that I was not theologically sophisticated yet? I now have many answers to this question, but at that point in time, the only thing I was worried about was fire insurance. Yeah. So Sue Erickson, at the age of 17, looked at me, bore into my eyeballs and said, you know, Sandy, I don't know the answer to that question, but if you think that the Holy Spirit is leading you to get baptized, you better do it. <laughs> I hadn't told her anything. This was all theoretical. <laughs> And with those words, it was as if the floodgates of a lifetime of hurt and betrayal and abandonment burst open. And I, who was so tough and so distant and so insulated, who wouldn't do anything to draw attention to myself and literally hadn't cried in a decade, and if you come from my background, you know why, because crying doesn't help, it just makes it worse. I erupted into racking, snotty, sloppy sobs. I couldn't speak, I couldn't explain myself. This wasn't pretty crying. This would not wind up in a movie. But my friend, the Christian, put her arm around me and walked me the mile over to the baptismal service with me snotting and sobbing and heaving the entire way. Slop, t-shirt, wipe the nose. And when we got there, there was this huge crowd gathered around the cow pond, and they're all lost in worship. This is a Jesus movement, okay? No one's got their eyes open. Everyone's swaying back and forth. There are hundreds of people. And while I'm sobbing and snotting and crying, I'm, and don't want to draw one ounce of attention to myself, excuse me, pardon me, I have to get to the water. I have to get baptized. <laughs> Let me through, please. I made such a scene. And by the time I got to the edge of the water, one of the guys in the water, I now know he was a local pastor, but back then I was a Catholic kid raised in a Jewish no uh, neighborhood. I didn't even know Protestants existed. I didn't know there were local pastors. <laughs> this guy pulls me into the water and he starts asking me the essential questions. He said, do you believe in Jesus? Have you repented of your sins? Are you ready to start a new life with him? And with tears flowing and snot streaming, yes, Yes, yes. And so that man dunked me under that muddy cow pond, if you've ever been in one, and I came up a brand new creature. And the gates of heaven opened, and this scruffy adolescent felt the love of God flood her broken world, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. It was like someone had pulled the plug on a terrible infection, and I just needed it washed clean. And so on the ride home in the caravan the next day, with my face toward the window because I didn't want everybody to see that I was still crying. I remember whispering over and over again to this God whose voice I now recognized, please don't ever go away, please, please. Now I would love to tell you that I returned home and was welcomed by parents who were thrilled to see the change in my life, who were grateful that someone somehow had reached me in my anger and my hurt and I wasn't gonna become a statistic. 
But the truth is that I went home to the same alcoholic and abusive situation from which I'd come. And in less than two months, my mother took her own life. And in less than six months, my father told me that this new address he found very disruptive and he wanted me to either change this new attitude of mine or to change my address. And in the naivety of my new faith, I trusted God and I chose the new address. And so I found myself essentially an orphan at the age of 16. But something profound had shifted in my orientation that fateful day in August at that Jesus festival. My citizen had shifted to another kingdom. I knew I was not alone. And God navigated what by all assessments were impossible circumstances for my good. First, God found me a new family. At the very last second when I was prepping to move into my car, not a good plan, by the way, I was invited to go live with a family that I babysat for for years. And this was a healthy home. Not a perfect home, but a healthy one. They didn't beat their kids. No one ever got thrown down the stairs. They remembered to pick their children up after nighttime events. Adults actually cooked meals and did laundry. And I had that last chance in those last two years of my childhood to actually redefine normal. And for those of you who come from my background, you know that redefining normal is your greatest challenge. These people became my surrogate parents. I was able to finish high school, which was actually quite dicey because I wasn't a legal resident, by the way. Another miracle for another time. And when God made it clear that I, the orphan, was to go on to train for ministry, who knew you could do that? Who knew there were things like Bible colleges and ordination and Protestants? Yeah, who knew? <laughs> These folks drove up every fall to my little Christian college for Parents' Day. And it turns out that between my mother's social security benefits, a janitorial job at a local office building, and an RA position, I was able to get through college. And it further turned out that I was accepted for credentials as one of the very few at that time female ministers in the Assemblies of God. Hmm. But when it became apparent that I was a little too interested in academics, that would be Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and my interest in PhD studies, and a little too prone for leadership, for the comfort zone of the culture that I was now a part of, God opened up another impossible door. And that was Harvard University. Harvard University, live in my car, Harvard University, just say. <laughs> and so after seven, count them seven years of hard labor, learning everything from historical Hebrew grammar to Iron Age archeology, span but most important, to see my faith through the eyes of a skeptic, which is a very important skill, I launched my own career training ministers. First, at Asbury Theological Seminary, oops, sorry, that's Gordon Conwell and Harvard, East Coast, other side of the Rockies. <laughs> I went to Asbury Theological Seminary, which is in Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah, there you go. Then down to Wesley Biblical Seminary, which is in Jackson, Mississippi. Then to Wheaton College. You've heard of that one, probably, because it's not quite as far away. By the way, Chicago is not the East Coast. <clears throat> And then Westmont College came calling. They, you, thought I was a pretty good fit. And so we came. Although I had no idea that you can actually wear flip-flops all year round. It's true. And I didn't realize that only people from outside California call it Cali. I'm putting that away. We came. And for one of the bigger transitions of our lives, we came. And we are so grateful to be a part of your community. So, bringing this to a close here, how did this grimy kid, well on her way to becoming a statistic, with no perceivable future, find out about Jesus and eventually become who I am? And the answer is, because God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And how did it happen? Because some very average, everyday, extraordinary people, not wise by human standards, or influential, or noble, not a varsity athlete, or a valedictorian among them, dared to love me. And they saw in me, this lowly one, this one despised, someone worthy of God's attention. 
Brothers and sisters, think of who you were when God called you and know that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So Westmont College, we are just getting to know each other now. But I hope that you can hear me when I tell you this. It might be a little soon, but the Holy Spirit will hopefully help. God is not impressed with your credentials, nor is he daunted by your deficits. It's not about who you were. It's not even about who you are. It's about who God is and therefore who he is making you to be. It really doesn't matter if you were a teen star finalist or a grimy, relationally challenged underachiever. That would be me. He's chosen the weak things of this world to confound the wise, and I stand in testimony to that truth. So are you still standing on the edges, hoping that no one will notice that you're not actually in yet? Hey, dude, come on in. The water's fine. Are you sitting here this morning thinking that you are such a mess, that there is no way your life can make a difference? You are so wrong. He is building his kingdom. And if you are willing, he will build his kingdom in you. And if you remain willing, he will build his kingdom through you. Can I pray for you? Father, as we pause in the silence of this space, in the privacy of our own seats, in the privacy of our own hearts. Lord, Holy Spirit, I know that you have called out to every person in this room. And I know that the answers that you've gotten in response have been so mixed. But the crazy thing is you can hear every one of those answers. Father, will you impress on our hearts this morning that it's not about who we are, it's about who you are. Will you impress on our hearts this morning that the arms of the Father are open wide and that he is willing, you are willing and able to embrace every one of us. Father, will you impress on our hearts this morning that there are gifts, gifts that have been planted deep in every life in this room and your greatest joy is to deploy those gifts for the glory of God and the cause of the gospel and the transformation of a broken world. And Lord, I pray especially this morning for those whose stories echo my own. And I pray that you will wrap your arms around those hearts this morning and let the tears wash the hurt away and let the dawn of the sunrise fill their hearts and minds today. And it is in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.